if Bitcoin goes to 100K this year, without a doubt, we go to 100% utilization of block space from monetary transactions. And then the only question is, how much do people want JPEGs? What I wanted to push back on was this idea that there's nothing we can do. This is where I get a little frustrated with just the JPEG thing in general. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here with Pierre. Pierre, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Preston. All right. What the hell is going on here with this ordinal stuff? I, uh, you know, on the face of it, I'm just looking at it. It's like, hey, it's a free and open market. Like, just let let this be. Um, but I think for most people, they might not even know what we're talking about right now with respect to ordinal. So just give people a really simple way for them to understand this peer. Yeah, sure thing. So the really simple way to understand it is that um, in 2021, uh, we activated a soft fork called Taproot. Uh, Taproot completely changed uh, how Bitcoin scripting, how smart contracts on Bitcoin are done. And um, one of the differences with uh, past scripting systems in Bitcoin is that there's really no limit to how much data you can put in what is called an input. So an input is the piece of the transaction. And in fact, most transactions have several inputs that allows you to unlock Bitcoin from what's called an unspent transaction output, a pre-existing output that came from another past transaction. So inputs are the unlocking mechanism. Typically, um, they have a digital signature in them that is from the same private key that generated the address that's in the output. And so the script says, um, you know, whoever can prove that they control this address can unlock these Bitcoin in the future. And then the way you, the way you prove it is by putting a signature inside of an input. Um, ordinals and inscriptions, what they've done is um, because the input in Taproot, the pay to Taproot input, does not have a limit on um, its size or its the operations in it, um, they've pushed lots of data in there. And then they have a way of um, interpreting that data to essentially be able to store arbitrary files uh, in Bitcoin's blockchain. So in, uh, you know, it so far it's been uh, images so they've put like jpegs and pngs in there um, but they've also put um, actual software in the sense that uh, you can put javascript in there and then uh, when you extract it you can run that code and play minesweeper or whatever uh, from javascript that was encoded inside of bitcoin's blockchain Okay, so I think for anybody hearing that, it, it sounds very concerning uh, from on the surface without having any type of uh, deep intellectual understanding of, of what all that means. So going back further than 2021, which you referenced, we had the SegWit update. So before SegWit, a transaction would have the input, it would have the scripts and the signature, and then it has the output. The, these were one megabit blocks prior to SegWit. SegWit comes along and we increase this to four megabytes with three megabytes being the witness data and one megabyte being the input and the output. So in that one megabyte input output portion of, of every block, you're saying that the input now has an unbound amount of, of data so you can exceed the one megabytes. Is that, is that correct? Um, so the at the block level, there's still the block size limit. And so, uh, what, meaning that uh, in practice, a uh, taproot input can take up a whole block. Mm -hmm. So up to four megabytes. Um, and that's something that we actually saw yesterday was that uh, it, it was almost, uh, you know, just one, a one, one input uh, script that, was taking up, you know, it was like 98% of the whole block size limit. Um, but the block size limit is still there. Uh, it's just that there's no limit at the input or transaction level, um, meaning that one of these JPEGs can crowd out um, any other kind of transaction from that block. If 
some some way somehow they are paying uh, a fee uh, in order to um, take up that space. So you're talking about, and let's uh, dig into the event that you're talking about yesterday because the picture of it is is. I don't want to say concerning, but it just kind of like makes your eyebrows go up, kind of like, okay, well, that doesn't seem good because it literally consumed that entire block, that four megabyte block. Um, and this was a Luxor mining pool that mined this block. They included the block and it had no fee attached to it because they mined the block and they can pick which transaction they want in the block. Now, if you're my if you're a miner part of that mining pool, um, you would think that they would be looking to uh, reallocate their resources somewhere else because uh, Luxor basically made the decision on behalf of everybody who was allocating resources to them to choose one transaction with no fee attached to it. So they're, the amount of fees that were collected for, for mining that block and doing all the work for that block wasn't conducted. They didn't. They chose to have a lower fee in the block. So walk us through some of this. Yeah, so... In this particular case with Luxor, because of how their payout is structured to those who are providing hash rate to their pool, um, it's actually Luxor that absorbed uh, that um, that absence of fee. So they absorbed that cost themselves. Um, I think, though, that... It Which would have been about how much up here? Sorry to interrupt you, but how much yeah. would that normally have, have been that they would have made additionally for beyond the block reward? Because there is excess capacity in block space right now, the estimate I've seen was $2,000 worth of fees. Um, and I think that it was a mistake on their part from the optics of it. Yes. Would have just put a transaction fee in there anyway, even yeah. though they know they're going to collect it back. Uh, at least it would have looked better uh, than to just put it in a zero fee. And unless their intent is to troll, uh, you know, that that might be another possibility. But um, I think that their intent was um, a, a good faith, uh, you know, uh, view of it would be that they are excited about inscriptions because it's going to um, create more demand for block space and drive up uh, transaction fees. Uh, which ultimately get paid out to miners, which they're a part of that ecosystem. Yeah. Does this, so this also gets into when we talk about the ordinal piece, uh, it's about the ordering that the Satoshis were mined. Talk to us about some of this, because this, I, I find this very confusing and I, and I think it's concerning from the standpoint of fungibility. And I know this isn't happening on the base layer, this is happening after. This is somebody else on like with their own side chain, right? Or something like that. Uh, I wouldn't describe it as a side chain. I would describe it as kind of uh, the Bitcoin equivalent of astrology, right? Of looking at the moons and the stars and, you know, uh, kind of fitting on some some kind of story onto it. Um, yeah. And so um, basically saying that, look, there's there's going to be less than 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis. So each Satoshi, technically, you could attach a serial number to that Satoshi, and then um, you can have a methodology by which that serial number follows that Satoshi through transactions, despite the fact that with every transaction, um, at, on a technical level, there's no concept of like a Satoshi that was unlocked in this input went to... Uh, Satoshi in this output. Um, rather, they get pooled together mm -hmm. uh, when they get unlocked, and then they get locked back up into new outputs. And you know, there's there's no concept of serial numbers or anything like that on on chain. Um, but they've you know created an, an arbitrary methodology of saying, okay, here's how the serial number follows the Satoshi uh, through transactions. I think it's a it's a harmless hobby, you know, like numerology or uh, anything like that. But, um, you know, I think a concern would be, well, I don't have to get into the concerns right now. We can continue the conversation. No, let, let, yeah, let's cover it. Let's hear it. Yeah. If, if, if this becomes a popular pastime, right. If this becomes like, uh, uh, you know, football <laughs> world cup, uh, you know, and, and people really 
uh, start to take this seriously, then um, it it does make it just uh, where new fungibility could be impacted, but also that if then the inscriptions associated with these ordinals, with these serial numbers, uh, if these inscriptions develop kind of a, a market value uh, that is significant, then you could see a significant crowding out of Bitcoin transactions uh, with inscriptions. And, uh, you know, somebody who wants to open a lightning channel has to pay, you know, 100 times more than they otherwise would have because society in general has decided to value, uh, you know, issuing JPEGs on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, uh, you know, a, a tremendous amount. And that's kind of a, a social layer type thing of, uh, you know, people, we could talk about kind of the psychology of NFTs. Are they a status game of people, you know, trying to show off uh, their art or their patronage of art or their art collection? Um, and with a social phenomenon, it's, um, yeah, it, 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 I don't know. I don't know if it'll take off, right? If inscriptions and ordinals will become popular. Um, but I think that it would be to the detriment of other use cases for Bitcoin, namely uh, moving, you know, Bitcoin back and forth for payments of goods and services or uh, for any other kind of really monetary transaction rather than symbolic, um, uh, you know, inscription. It's interesting. So you work with a mining company, uh, Riot Platform, as a vice president. And I would think that uh, from the mining side of the house, they might actually be a little excited about something like this. Yeah. So um, without a doubt, the fact that the transaction fees, uh, you know, accrue to the miners, I think has created um, kind of uh, s some excitement in the mining community um, around uh, ordinals and inscriptions. Um, I think that from a business perspective, the main question is, um, will other sources of transaction fees, namely just normal transactions, let's call them. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to describe them, you know, too normatively of like good transactions or bad transactions, but transactions that are, are monetary in nature where the script is really about unlocking the Satoshis. It's not about uh, putting data onto the blockchain, um, you know. My expectation uh, would be that demand for those monetary transactions would be uh, so great in the future that it really does um, price out um, JPEGs and that there's just JPEGs might be a fad uh, that fad NFTs on Solana and Ethereum, you know, they are down big time if you look at kind of the volumes and their value. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe in the next bull market, they'll come back. Maybe not. Um, whereas I think that monetary transaction demand um, will continue to increase as Bitcoin, you know, as a store of value, as a medium of exchange continues to increase in adoption. Um, further, I think that if there is, you know, in Ryan's case, uh, we're not just mining Bitcoin. We're also putting Bitcoin on our balance sheet. And so um, there's kind of the question of does how does this impact the accrual of value to BTC, the asset? Um, if people are using block space to store JPEGs and it becomes really expensive to transact on chain to move BTC around, maybe that would actually decrease the value of BTC um, and decrease the adoption rate of Bitcoin as a monetary system because that is being crowded out by the adoption rate of Bitcoin as an art gallery. Um, so, you know, there's kind of an open business question there. I don't think that it's necessarily the case that every use of block space should be celebrated because ultimately um, there is a kind of a cannibalism or a crowding out effect um, in, in, in the long term. In the short term, um, it is true that 
over the past 18 months, blocks have been at 75 to 80 percent utilization, mm -hmm. meaning that any kind of marginal increase in block space demand from a JPEG is not actually impacting monetary transactions. Mm -hmm. The reason that we're at 75 to 80 percent utilization is because of SegWit adoption uh, in 2020, 2021. Um, and so uh, my view is that we should be looking to use block space more and more efficiently in order to have a uh, kind of a margin of safety where uh, meaning that, you know, if, if Bitcoin goes to 100K this year, um, without a doubt, we go to 100% utilization of block space from monetary transactions. And then the only question is, how much do people want JPEGs? Right. And if the answer is a lot, uh, then we could see that even though there's a massive backlog of monetary transactions in the mempool, uh, that the, the, there might still be a significant amount of block space consumption coming from JPEGs. You know, for me, when I'm thinking about the JPEG thing, and, and I think everything you said, you also have to keep in the back of your mind, you have these other quote unquote decentralized blockchains and you and I kind of smirk when we, when we hear that um, competing for the fee and the, the quote unquote minting of these JPEGs being on there. And so maybe it's just a function of where we're at with the, the blocks being so empty right, right now at this exact moment in time. Uh, and they're just people were just trying to demonstrate the technology and, and put it out there. But uh, as those fees would potentially go higher um, with uh, global use for monetary reasons, you would think that people that are quote unquote minting uh, JPEGs are going to go find somewhere else to go do that because they clearly don't understand the the difference between truly decentralized protocols and and ones that are not. So they're just going to go wherever. Um, that's my hope. Um, but if it really ingrains itself in kind of the the culture at the social level, then the you know the, the that might not be the case. Uh, and it, it might really be something that sticks around on Bitcoin well, for a while. It's where I would push back, Pierre, and I think you will totally agree with uh, the thing that's going to really set this thing off in the future is fixed income the the inability to to handle the credit markets and them being inverted to inflation rates because supply chains are breaking down so when that flood of interest for sound money eventually comes and it's coming um i just think that it just dwarfs the stupidity that's behind some of these actions and it just it just withers away agree so Ultimately, that's why, you know, I, my view is let's wait and see. Um, and the, the other argument for let's wait and see is that there might actually be legitimate use cases for very large taproot inputs um, that would be monetary in nature, you know, in order to enable a very large monetary transaction. Um, we don't know exactly what that use case is. Uh, is yet, but um, if we acted too soon and closed that off by mm -hmm. limiting the size of taproot inputs, um, then maybe we would never see that very useful uh, and valuable use case emerge. Um, but yeah, I, I think that um, the, it, it, when we think about the lines of defense for Bitcoin block space, I think the first line of defense is the social layer of uh, you know, when when blockchain.com was dragging their feet on implementing SegWit uh, for their wallets, uh, they would constantly get ratioed on tweets from Bitcoiners saying when SegWit um, today, you know, with Coinbase, we we always roast them about when lightning um, and so on and so forth. It, there was also transaction batching uh, that was a big efficiency gain. So I think on the social layer. Uh, it is good to be lobbying against inefficient use of block space. The second line of defense is the economic layer of the transaction fees. So ultimately, I think that's what got through to blockchain.com 
uh, was during the 2021 bull market that um, their transaction fees for the users of their wallets became really high because they didn't have SegWit. Mm -hmm. um, and that pressured them into implementing SegWit. So I think economic pressure is the second line of defense and it is highly effective. Um, the third is really the peer-to-peer -peer node level of setting policies about um, the mempool acceptance and relay. Um, you see this, for example, with, um, I believe the dust limit. So if you try to send like one Satoshi as a transaction, uh, nodes just won't relay that um, because it's just a waste of block space. Um, but I don't believe that's um, a consensus layer rule. That's the fourth line of defense is consensus layer rules. So there you see the block size limit is one of those. Um, there's also a signature operations limit. I believe it's 20,000 signature operations per block. Um, there are also per transaction limits. Uh, so you're limited in the number of inputs, the number of outputs you can have in a transaction. Um, and, um, you know, there's there's other uh, limits that um, are all sorts of specifics related to scripts and to other um, parts of the transaction and of the block. Um, so I think right now, as far as ordinals and inscriptions are concerned, we're at that first layer, the social layer. Um, and I, I agree that, you know, we, we don't need to immediately jump to the consensus layer to fix this problem. Um, it probably is something that we could wait and watch for five years, 10 years, see how things play out, uh, through a, a couple more bull markets and, uh, maybe hyper Bitcoinization. Um, what what I I didn't uh, what I reacted really strongly to in the dialogue around uh, ordinals and inscriptions was this view that there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do about it because Be Bitcoin is censorship resistant and code is law, and that there's no um, yeah there's there's th th there's no opportunity here to. Uh, change the rules. And um, I just think that's false, uh, that that actually is a misunderstanding of the Bitcoin protocol. Um, you know, the Bitcoin protocol does change over time. I mean, as we saw with the Taproot soft fork. Um, and there's also no reason to say, oh, we should not have done the Taproot soft fork. I think that's also a mistake. Um, this kind of view that, oh, we have to have ossification. Um, no, I think that we can uh, look at data, we can use reason, and we can look at the code and our, you know, our knowledge of software engineering and protocol research to make amendments uh, as needed in order to, um, you know, help Bitcoin. Now, the other th part of the d dialogue that I reacted strongly to was this view that uh, Bitcoin block space is a neutral data layer that um, we should be agnostic as to what data goes into block space and mm. that we should let it be a free market. Uh, and I think that you you iterated that view earlier in the episode. Um, and I just think that's outright false. Um, I think that uh, Bitcoin block space should be and and is currently already and has been for the entire existence of Bitcoin regulated, zoned for monetary transactions. The, that the Bitcoin as a system is ordered towards the end of being peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And the cash transactions are what this ledger is for. And that treating it as a neutral data layer is like saying, oh, I... I should be able to go onto my bank website and upload JPEGs to my uh, transaction history at JP Morgan. And that's like, uh, sure, but that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense from a rational perspective of we have different systems that are oriented towards different ends and that we should optimize those systems to achieve those ends. 
And if we treat block space that way, then we should um, try to find ways to make space for monetary transactions and not subsidize or enable uh, you know, art galleries, medical records, supply chain management, like all these things where people have said like, oh, we need to use Bitcoin's blockchain technology for all of these different ends. Um, I, I disagree with, I think they're, they're for monetary purposes. Well, it's, it seems like when SegWit rolled out that that was kind of a general consensus thought that you just shared there because the sender, the input and the output was limited to one megabyte and the 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 witness data was at three megabytes. So you basically uh, had this situation where uh, call it uh, one four or I'm sorry three fourths of the of the data that somebody would write into their transaction was for whatever they wanted to put in there uh, as far as the witness data, and then the other part was reserved specifically for transactions so that you don't fill the block with. Uh, nonsense, right? Like the transactions are always going to be a core part of it, but it's only going to be a percentage of it. And it seems like with Taproot, we get away from this because of maybe a lack of limitation that needs to be built into the input uh, portion. So with SegWit, there was a limit on what you can put in the witness. And that limit was not um, part of the Taproot proposal. So uh, in the Taproot proposal, all they have is a limit on the number of signatures you can have in the witness. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like that's the soft fork that's needed is that you have to bound that. Well, so they have to bound another operation, which is the push operation, which is what's pushing data into the, the witness stack. And so um, the, the, the problem with that or one of the counter arguments against having a limit on pushes is that there might be really great scripts that are monetary transactions that would use that push, um, yeah. you know, a significant number of times. And so, um, you know, there's lots but, but of if it's a soft, if, if it's a soft fork, Pierre, sorry to interrupt you. If it's a soft fork, you can choose to run that or not run it right as a node operator. Um, it's, uh, so there's a lot of nuance there. I mean, I think that you would not want to run a soft fork that is not a uh, rough consensus, meaning that um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the wider ecosystem is on board with you. So if you try to fly solo, then you would start rejecting blocks that others see as valid um, and that, you know, you're not um, in consensus there. So I definitely... But you could change your your mempool policy, for example, to uh, not relay transactions that have uh, these big inputs. Um, I I don't know how much of an impact that would have because what we saw with Luxor is that they sent that transaction out of band, so it's not like they had to go through the peer to peer network and rely on third party mempools to relay that. Um, I think that there's lots of research work that could be done on specifically how we would structure a soft fork for um, countering these inscriptions. But again, I think that we're very far from having to get to that fourth layer of a consensus level change, um, given where we're at today. Um, but what, what I wanted to push back on was this idea that there's nothing we can do. We, yeah. we have... Yeah a wide range of tools at our disposal that we can use. Now we have to use them very carefully. Some of them are very sharp. Uh, some of them, you know, are blunt, uh, for example, you know, nagging people on Twitter. <laughs> uh, but the, the sharp ones of changing the consensus rules, we have to be extremely cautious around that, right? We don't, we don't want to cause more problems than we're solving for sure. Um, and there's an extensive process of review that goes into any soft fork, including the Taproot soft fork. Um, but it's on the table mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, we shouldn't pretend otherwise. I think that folks who are pretending otherwise like inscriptions, right? And that's fine. Uh, but um, I, I don't want any kind of gaslighting of like, there's nothing we can do about it. It's the, the better argument would be inscriptions are good. We should not 
contemplate a soft fork to, you know, essentially uh, put them as invalid. And uh, then we can get into arguments about why. Um, and and that's that's fine as well. And I think to me, the most interesting argument is really about what are the other opportunities that we can use um, large taproot inputs for and um, let's develop those. Right. I, I think that that's a really great direction to go in rather than in uh, saying, hey, let's do more research on how to do lots of inscriptions and build a whole economy of e NFTs on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. I think that that's that would be a bad outcome. A good outcome is, hey, let's figure out how to get zero knowledge proofs that are very large uh, on in taproot inputs and um, things things of, of that nature that are related to monetary transactions rather than really inefficient use of black space. So when we look at the uh, when we look at the block, the, the, the full block size of uh, four megabytes and how one megabyte of that is supposed to be just the input and output. When we when we look at what recently happened uh, with uh, what's the name of the uh, the Luxor mining pool, um, whenever they wrote that block and it was completely full, almost the full four megabytes was was that all from uh, just the input with the the scripts that they are running from the input, almost all four megabytes. Because my understanding is that that it's supposed to be bound to only one megabyte at that point, right? Because the um what's called the stripped size that does not include the witness that just has to be less than one megabyte. Okay. So then the witness can be um, up to four megabytes. Okay. Is kind of the or three, the, the witness data can be up to three and then be up to four because it can. Um, oh, I see what you're all limit. Right. Because the input was under the the one, it barely used it. So then, I guess the the witness data can consume the remainder to, for less than four. Okay, I gotcha. Um, you know, this is this is where I get a little frustrated with uh, just the JPEG thing in general, uh, and I just want to kind of paint a, an example for people. So anybody can mint a JPEG uh, on whatever blockchain they or quote unquote blockchain they want to use. Um, obviously, Bitcoin because it's truly decentralized as a place that a person would want to store whatever or memorializes, I think a better uh, word, an event that it actually took place. That makes sense to me that people want to do that. But to store the actual uh, full data of a JPEG on, on the blockchain doesn't make sense to me uh, from just a legal standpoint. So think about it. So like, let's say Beeple, He's super famous for selling these JPEGs for $50 million or whatever. If he would sell you one of his JPEGs, uh, that you're now the owner of it and you can basically do whatever you want with it, you can license it or, or whatever, um, and you want to memorialize that event, that sale, that proof of sale into the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, I guess I'm of the opinion that a person should be able to do that to memorialize that event. And, and it doesn't not take much data to do that because you could hash the contract or whatever and then stick that uh that public key into the into the hash or into the blockchain to prove that it took place. So at the end of the day, like when a person would let's say that I would or it's another person would argue, well, he sold it to me versus the person that supposedly has this thing written into the blockchain. The way that's actually going to get adjudicated is in a court system, no matter what. That's how that gets adjudicated, whether it's in the blockchain or not. The blockchain is just a, a really great way of prove it's getting it notarized, right? Mm -hmm. Um it's it's the best form of notarization that that's ever existed. So I guess when when I see the current setup where people are completely jamming uh, data into an entire block with just one or five transactions in it, to me there's there's a major inefficiency that's taking place in the existing setup. Because it's not accounting for the first principles thinking of um, your the, the best thing that you can use it beyond money 
is for the notarization piece, uh, which does not require a lot of data at all. Yeah, so I think that that's one way of conceiving of this data layer. Another, perhaps one that would make more sense than what you just described is, you know, the there are 3D CAD designs for 3D printing firearms mm -hmm. that are often difficult to download in foreign countries that have strict mm. controls over that. Um, and that this is a way of creating a censorship resistant way of disseminating information that, um, you know, the government wants to, to, to ban essentially. Um, and so that to me makes a lot more sense than the Beeple, you know, intellectual property situation that, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for because I am pro second amendment. Um, and, and it's like, okay, well, on some level, if you're willing to pay the transaction fee, then it is what it is. Because yeah. furthermore, even, even with the soft fork that I described of somehow limiting the number of op push or limiting the size of inputs, there would still be, it. all that would do is make it more expensive to put data on the blockchain. It would not stop people from doing it. There's no way to stop people from doing it. Yeah. Uh, all we're talking about here is how do we like, how do we tax it? How do we disincentivize it? Um, and so people would still be able to put, you know, 3D gun uh, diagrams on the Bitcoin blockchain. They would just have to pay a much higher transaction fee, uh, total transaction fee. Um, and also it would be less efficient because now they would have to say, let's say they would have to use up three megabytes um, instead of one megabyte because we have created an artificial constraint on the input size. Now they've got to create lots of inputs in lots of transactions to add up to um, that uh, data. Um, so there's lots of trade-offs here uh, and to, to consider, but that that was the use case that, that tug at my heartstrings. Well, and I think that that's a great counter to what I was saying. Um, I guess the, the the response I have for you is, is why does it have to happen on layer one? Can't we push some of these activities up onto the second layer or, or higher? Uh, because it's Bitcoin being layer one being a global broadcast system means that it makes it censorship resistant in a way that any other layer would not be. So, um, for example, with Lightning, the data storage would happen on specific Lightning nodes, not on all Lightning nodes. So in order to use the Lightning network, you would not need to download this data. Whereas in order to use the Bitcoin network, you have to download this data. Um, and so that's really the, the difference between a global broadcast system and what you could describe as kind of a local point to point uh, system. Yeah, it really, it really yeah. seems like people like the, there needs to be a deep uh, conversation at, at a global level on just use cases outside of money and basically notarization uh, on layer one. And then uh, really kind of get at the heart of what you're saying here, which is this uh, op push uh, within the, the input um, of each of each transaction. I don't. I don't know that you're going to get consensus built because this is a highly technical uh, conversation, and it, it's. It seems like the consensus could get really quite confused. Like the the general population could get quite confused as to what to to side with or what. Right? Uh, how how do you see that kind of taking place moving forward? Yeah. So the the I think we're already there in terms of the confusion. Uh, there's lots of confusion. Um, and I think that um, it it will crystallize when if inscriptions continue to the, if if it's not a fad that fizzles out, if they continue to um, be used and that they drive up transaction fees materially for other participants in the system, then I think that we'll see 
the conversation around it evolve beyond mm -hmm. its current state. Um, now, whether that will evolve into a soft fork, I don't know. Um, that will probably take decades of, uh, you know, evolution and maybe, you know, we'll see. But uh, the uh, my hope is that we can just snuff this out at the first line of defense, which is the social layer of saying like, hey, guys, like, not cool. We're not into this. Stop doing it. Find something else to do. Go work. I don't, think that's, gonna, I don't think that that's going to work, Pierre. I think that the thing that works is just economic incentive. And um, maybe we just maybe yeah. we just need the world and, and credit markets to start uh, reflecting reality and more, uh, you know, use on the base yeah. layer from, you know, all the all the pent up fiat that's been stuffed into just worthless things around the world. I agree. I think ultimately it'll be a combination of that first and second line of the economic incentives of transaction fees going up um, combined with the social layer saying, hey, this this isn't worth it. Like you, nobody's going to buy your worthless mint. So don't waste your money, you know, on these high transaction fees. And then that combination, because, yeah, that's I, I hope that that's enough um, and that we won't have to. Uh, continue this debate um, that already is, I think, very, very muddled. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of conflicting um, incentives as well, uh, where really the the developers, they don't want to do a soft fork that limits the size of inputs because they're interested in opportunities to use that for valid transactions, right? Or sorry, wrong terminology there for legitimate monetary transactions. So they are opposed to having that conversation. I totally get. Um, folks in the mining industry are opposed to such a soft fork because they want to drive up transaction fees. Again, I totally understand where they're coming from. Um, and then you have uh, Bitcoin people who maybe see this as like, hey, let's get the NFT narrative going in Bitcoin and that that will bump, pump the Bitcoin price up and kind of reduce demand for Ethereum and Solana. Again, you know, that's a perspective. <laughs> um, and the only people that are really um, hurt in a way by this is one, um, node operators who are resource constrained so that, you know, they, they, they have limited bandwidth, they have um, and, and, you know, they're living in a country that does not have fiber optic internet, whatnot. That's not me, but I'm happy to be their representative. <laughs> um, and uh, people who are trying to send uh, small value transactions that are monetary in nature over the Bitcoin network, whether it's op the open or like a channel or sending a payment. But the block, the block size as a whole is not larger. So you're just saying that the, the cost to rebalance channels is going up because you're cluttering the chain. Yep. Um, okay, I gotcha. And then it's like, well, if I wanted, if I wanted to send fifty dollars worth of Bitcoin as remittances from uh, El Salvador to the U.S. or vice versa, um, you know, if there's no JPEGs, that might cost two cents. Mm -hmm. If there are JPEGs, it might cost five dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're talking about a a ten percent fee instead of a fraction of a percentage. And so, um, you know, the JPEG people would say, you know, so sad, too bad, you know, uh, use lightning instead. Um, and then they go and use a custodial lightning wallet uh, instead and, you know, pay. Yeah, that's where you really see it is the custodians. Uh, you're going to push people into a custodian situation where they're not holding their own keys because it's you're they're, you're using their services that have been um uh, it's cheaper for them to consolidate it all, right? And so that's that's maybe where that pushes it. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's one argument. Um, and um, yeah, so I think there there's there's so many different different people benefit from inscriptions, and different people incur the cost of inscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to tell where that nets out. Of like, oh, on net inscriptions are good for Bitcoin or bad for Bitcoin. Um, and to to prove that, 
Um, I just I, I, I have my my gut instinct on it, but um, I, I think that it's an open area of debate. Um, I don't like that there's folks on social media who are trying to say that there is no debate or that, you know, it's bad to argue against inscriptions and like their morality policing the the conversation around this. Um, no, I think that let's let's air out the arguments pro and con. And um, it's it's good to talk about it, even if we're not, you know, contemplating a soft fork to fix it immediately um, that that might be in the future in several years or decades. But um, in the meantime, I think it's good to have a conversation about it. People have raised the concern of illegal imagery being written into the blockchain and then this potentially being an attack vector from the state um, is saying, hey, you're running a full node and you have block whatever. And there is there is a very concerning picture that's been written into that block and you're distributing that that information and that data. What are your thoughts around this one? Yeah, Um my understanding is that in the existing Bitcoin blockchain, in op returns, there's already uh, illegal images. Um, and so I think that that's already the case without inscriptions. Um, that then uh, I'll leave it to the lawyers on, you know, what the specifics are there. Um, but so far, it hasn't really been an issue, despite that imagery being on the Bitcoin blockchain for several years now. Um, now, then there might be a question of quantity, right? What happens if there's a lot of it on the Bitcoin blockchain? Um, you know, and that's where um, that's an open question going forward. Uh, yeah. So my immediate thought on this is you could you could run a pruned node. Um, download it. You still have to download it to prove that you that that uh, all your transactions are valid. But I could you could say you could send me and let's say I trust you that this is that if I start my node right here, all the illicit images or whatever are after that block height, right? And I could just run a prune node, and then um, and then I'm running a node and I'm not uh, I'm not propagating, and I'm not suggesting that this is <laughs> this is the solution. I'm just for maybe jurisdictions. Let's say you're in a country and they are they are cracking down on node node runners that uh, people running nodes that um, because of this argument and it's it's a localized state level attack for whatever that jurisdiction is. Is that the workaround for people in those types of jurisdictions? Uh, it it could be. Um, I don't know if software that exists that would enable or that has that built in yet um maybe that that you know that that will get written um and i just think that it would be a shame if we had to change kind of the average bitcoin node trust model uh around um you know assuming validity for certain outputs uh because of this problem um but uh, there's, yeah, there's certainly ways that could, you know, mitigate that that issue. And um, yeah. And, and most of it is just because the the way that the blocks connect, you're effectively hashing. Get into some of the technical specs for people that would hear this and say, oh, no, I'm concerned. What are they talking about as far as like a pruned uh a pruned node. How does that work from a more of a technical sense, if you can explain it, Pierre? Yeah. So currently how a pruned node works is that you download all of the blocks when you're doing initial block download. And every time you download one, um, you verify that the output that is being spent um, and the input that is spending that output um, are uh, valid. And so the, you know, the signature in there gets verified and, um, that way, you know, there's no risk of an invalid input spending money that is not theirs essentially. Um, and so that does mean that you have to download, uh, the input and you have to process it. And then the pruning part is that the data after it has been verified gets deleted. 
Um, and that's the pruning part. Now, one nuance here is that in the Bitcoin Core software, there is a configuration parameter called assume valid that will not verify inputs and outputs, signatures, and thus, you know, running the, the script um, before a certain height. Mm -hmm. And so this allows people to download Bitcoins and verify the blockchain more quickly uh, than uh, they otherwise would uh, with a small trade-off of, hey, you have to trust that the developers put in the valid hash at that height. Mm -hmm. um, and historically, that hasn't been an issue because it's really easy to then verify that hash and to Very turn off easy. assume valid. Yeah. Yeah. Like I always turn off assume valid because I'm, you know, a psychopath uh, purist. Um, but uh, it, in reality, it's a, a it's a legitimate way of uh, accelerating initial block download. Yeah. yeah, and it is. It's very simple to be able to to validate that uh, at whatever block height you want. Um, yeah. So, okay, um, let's just fast forward five years into the future. Your highest probability conviction of what this conversation sounds like five years from now. Uh, remember when we were freaking out about inscriptions and uh, people were trying to shill them on social media? <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing with Satoshi Dice. Uh, you know, now we say, oh, remember when you could gamble on the Bitcoin blockchain with Satoshi Dice? Or uh, remember when colored coins were a thing? Or um, Omni? Omni is like uh, tethers on uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, USDT. That doesn't exist anymore. It got priced out um, and it migrated to other blockchains. And so I don't think this is going to have staying power at all. Um, but um, that's actually, I think that's a good thing because then for those situations where you do want to use an inscription, like your your 3D gun file or whatever, like um, there won't be so much consternation about you doing that and there won't be a limit on, you know, op push uh, stopping you from doing that. Um, so I hope that just at the social layer, uh, people don't start valuing inscriptions. Uh, and the, you know, in five years, we'll, we'll just be laughing about how, uh, you know, we thought that it was a big problem <laughs> or I did last question, Charlie Munger, he's at it again. He, yeah. uh, he, uh, was in the wall street journal today. Uh, what are your thoughts? Tell people about the article and tell people your thoughts, Pierre. Yeah, so um, I started reading the article with an open mind, as I always you know, read everything with, a, with an open mind. And um, it was interesting. I actually agreed with him on the uh, initial kind of framing, which is that there are corporations that are issuing unregistered securities and calling them cryptocurrencies. And they're doing it in a way that avoids having to disclose um, what they would normally have to disclose when raising financing from the general public through uh, debt or equity. And then his conclusion is that we should ban all cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, uh, which to me does not follow from the arguments that he's making. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one. And, you know, we can talk about the merits of regulating uh, token offerings and all that. But what I found to be really bizarre was his um, bringing up the Chinese Communist Party and, mm -hmm. and praising the Chinese Communist Party for banning Bitcoin in China. And, you know, that might work well to for a certain audience. I don't see that working very well with the Wall Street Journal audience of, hey, let's emulate communism. And I don't see it working well with the current House leadership, because in order for Charlie Munger to get his way within the next two years, he would have to get this bill through Congress. And the current House leadership is rather the, the Republican majority is rather hawkish on China and opposed to communism. In fact, 
currently what they're working on is a statement that is, uh, you know, very anti-communism is like this week's number one priority. So for Munger to try to persuade them by pointing to the Chinese Communist Party as a role model, um, I think that he's actually benefiting Bitcoin and severely undermining his cause. Um, so I guess I'm happy that he got this published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and perhaps that's why the Wall Street Journal allowed him to publish this as a giant self-sabotaging move for <laughs> the anti-Bitcoin uh, cause where, you know, he's saying like, OK, let's have, you know, uh, Elizabeth Warren and the Chinese Communist Party on one side and then, um, you know, Kevin McCarthy and uh, every honest American on the other side of this debate, which I think is great framing. Pierre, I can't I can't disagree with anything you just said. And I and it, I just find it so strange. This isn't the first time he's brought up the, the China thing and how he agrees with what they're doing. And it's just like, what in the world are you talking about right now? It Take just, the mic I mean, away. I mean, it does. It does. It's totally especially the 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 irony is this guy became a billionaire through free and open markets or, you know, prior to them becoming completely manipulated here in the past decade. Um, he's a total beneficiary of this capitalistic system and this democracy. And for him on his final, you know, days to be out there trumpeting the idea of, of communism and socialism is just, uh, I, I, I it, it literally takes, I have no words for it other than disgust. So then, and, and people who are listening to that, he has so many brilliant insights throughout his lifetime that it just seems completely incoherent with some of the other insights that he's had outside of Bitcoin, obviously, um, you know, on I, psychology I and other things. It's just crazy to me. I, I agree. And, you know, I, I'm a fan of value investing. Benjamin Graham was one of the first investing books, uh, the intelligent investor that I read. Um, and, you know, one way to look at it very cynically is that Berkshire Hathaway is lobbying the Texas legislature to enable them to subsidize them, to pay them to build natural gas peaker plants that turn on when there is a deficit of uh, electricity supply uh, in ERCOT and the Bitcoin miners who turn off uh, when there is a deficit like this that are through demand response are directly competing with peaker plants. And so from Berkshire Hathaway's perspective, Bitcoin mining in Texas is competing with their energy business. And so any kind of policies that they can advance that are anti-Bitcoin are in the interests of Berkshire Hathaway's uh, business. So that's kind of the cynical take on it. Um, I don't know if they're connected or not, uh, but uh, that's one way to um, maybe couch this in more capitalist uh, terms. Hmm. Fascinating. Any other highlights and things that are going on right now that you wanted to bring up? Not right now. I think that we'll, you know, we've covered a lot of ground uh, in, in the past hour. Uh, there, there are things on the horizon though, but I'll, I'll come back uh, and we'll, Please. we'll have some Please do. Please do, sir. You are always welcome. Uh, Pierre Rochard, Riot Platforms. Uh, they got a name change, correct? That's right. Yeah, we, We're leaving the blockchain behind because Riot is really approaching Bitcoin mining in a vertically integrated way. Uh, we acquired an electrical equipment designer and manufacturer, ESS Metron. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, we're we build our own hosting facilities. We're a construction company. Um and that by vertically integrating, we can kind of control our supply chain and uh, really be the lowest cost producer of uh, Bitcoin uh, out there. Um, so that's that's why we went with the name change, uh, you know, platforms, not blockchain. Wow, that's pretty exciting stuff. You guys moving upstream and I like it. Um, Pierre, thank you so much for making time. I think we threw this together in just the last couple hours and uh I was very excited to be able to have this conversation because like so many out there, I'm learning and you are an expert for sure in many of these areas. And uh, it's just such a breath of fresh air to talk to somebody that has so much common sense uh, behind the way that they're looking at things. So thanks for making time and coming on. 
Thanks for having me on, Press, and looking forward to the next one. Cheers. The regulators, uh, whoever, could shut down the bank account of any stablecoin issuer. Why do I want to go from fiat to Bitcoin to Bitcoin to fiat? Like, why are we doing this to ourselves, truly? Bitcoin is a completely different value proposition of sound money 